I'd like to talk today about uh, what I've written in my book. I chose to uh, entangle uh, or decipher what was happening in the post-Cold War era of what my uh, Marxist background would suggest is the contradictions within uh, human development as to what are the forces that force uh, progress and the forces that negate it or the fight for the right to uh, hold that privilege that allows them to exercise control and command over vast millions of people that essentially are either consumers or employees uh, to enhance the bottom line of a whole lot of uh, entities right across the world. It is fashionable to be anti-American if you're anti-capitalist, but most rising capitalism is in China and India. But that's not too fashionable because they just don't fit into that anti uncle Sam attitude. So even the anti-imperialists have lost their bearings and are more associated with the Islamists than with the issues of what Mark Twain would have talked about at the turn of the last uh, uh, century. What has happened since 1990 is that the end of the Cold War, <coughs> or in Eric Hobsbawm's uh, terms, the end of the age of uh, extremes, which essentially he uh, identified as starting at the First World War um, uh, with the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, which came directly as a result of a uh, hundred years of earlier uh, struggles in Europe, the creation of a society that essentially was a challenge to uh, colonialism and basically, in John Reed's word, 10 days that shook the world. And it lasted till 1990 when the Berlin Wall uh, came crumbling down, uh, thanks to uh, the people that we are now fighting in Afghanistan. But what happened uh, in the generation of my parents, or my generation, I'm turning 60 on November 20th, uh, is that we, sorry? I'm the same birthday as you. Oh, so is Robert Kennedy. Yes, sir, but we better not get shot. <laughs> um, what happened was that in those four generations, people were identified by what they thought and what they created. So human beings were categorized as socialists or uh, free market uh, pro uh, believers or Fabians or anarchists or Trotskyites or nationalists, or pacifists, or civil rights activists. And it culminated in a, in a collapse of ideas that has now restricted us to have identities that are based on color, race, and religion. So where at one time in Germany you would have deep division between social democrats and the Christian democrats and one segment of the population calling for a four day work week and the other asking for the strengthening of NATO. Today you have a Germany where you're identified by uh, how German you are in your nationality. Uh, the right wing groups are almost neo Nazi to the extent how anti immigrant you are. Those divisions in society are no longer about the left or the right. The labels are still there, but sometimes uh, the conservatives are a little bit more liberal than the liberals because, for example, in Canada, I will digress by the way it's here and there, but I don't speak from prepared notes, so that's the risk. Uh, in Canada, for example, in the liberal party, you have to be white to be liberal. If you're colored, you have to be conservative. Because in a bizarre form of racism that defies any explanation, uh, Mr. Ignatiev and uh, uh, Bob Ray just have to be very firm believers in liberalism, individual liberty, uh, uh, a dash of social democracy, etc. 
But Mr. Gurbaksh Mali simply has to produce 1,000 people in a hall. And Mr. Mali then has to sit at a 75 degree angle behind the current Prime Minister for question period times, or the leader of the opposition. So the Chinese, or the Sikh, or the Arab, doesn't have to have ideas. No, they have to be ultra-conservative, ultra-orthodox, to be qualified to be liberal. That's how bizarre, and I'm giving an example of uh, Canada. If you go to the United Kingdom, the Labour Party's color segment, not the Black Caucus. The Black Caucus still hasn't yet figured out what to do, but the colored segment is all ultra-conservative people. They're not left-wing laborers. They don't believe in the public sector. They can only deliver the anti-racism vote, which is in the Olympics of victimhood, who gets the gold medal? <laughs> and so I'm Muslim. I'm right now in the top league. We all three medals in the Olympics of victimhood go to the Muslims. You know, not the black Muslims, the, the slightly better colored ones. <laughs> because the who are black Christian, Muslim, black atheist, that's at the bottom of the league. Nobody cares for that, guys, unless you're in uh, Detroit and you're involved in the shootout. So what has happened is that as a result of the absence of ideological debate, the resurgence of race and religious-based politics has come about. So we've got a fair number of idiots riding, ri rising to the level where they can inflict the largest amount of pain to the most number of people and wear the funniest attire to be respected by everyone else. So if you can go around with smoke coming out of a pot with a hat that is huge and tall, and you're from the Greek Orthodox Church, and you can mumble something that nobody understands, the Prime Minister of Canada will have breakfast with you. But if you are a Greek Canadian who's going to play hockey and likes sausages and simply wants to eat ice cream and has a wife, two children, and a mortgage, you don't count. You know, ugly enough to be called Greek. That's how bad things have become. And religious tyranny has gone to the extent that we now have rabbis saying that on Sabbath you cannot take elevators. And we have the story of a couple that has to climb five sets of stairs, with, uh, seven flights of stairs with five children on, in Sabbath because God will be angry if you take the elevator. And educated people with sometimes graduate degrees in anthropology and sociology submit to that nonsense. We've got people who've proven to the Supreme Court of Canada that the child going to school with a dagger is a holy thing. That's a religion of peace. You couldn't have done that in the Cold War. Because people would have discussed and debated the validity of your ideas. They would have said, there is no merit to the argument that a young boy should wear a dagger stitched in his inside shirt as a matter of piety and peace. People would have said that the flag of Saudi Arabia with a sword underneath it takes away the right of the Saudi government to say, we are a people of peace. <laughs> so what has happened is that from the red states, uh, uh, nut bars of uh, Christian evangelicals, hate mongers, to Sikh extremists, to uh, rabbis that hate elevators, <laughs> to uh, uh, Hindu priests who burn Christians in vans because it is a holy thing to do, and uh, desecrate Muslim graveyards in India as an act of worship, everything is fine. Because there's only one slogan that they can read. I am proud to be dash fill in the blacks, Canadian. I'm proud to be German. You did nothing to be a German. It's your parents who did something. And even they're not proud of what you're saying. But here's the problem that we have for the Muslim community, and that's why I wrote this book. Let us see. Take the extreme case of all Jewish people in the world going crazy like that 
rabbi and saying, 